Well, a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you are tuning in from. My name is Adrian Reed, and a very warm welcome to this BA Community webinar. Um, I'm really pleased today to say that we're joined by Corin Thomas. Now, uh, many of you will probably know Corin from either perhaps seeing her speak at a conference or um, seeing her, her, her work elsewhere. Uh, I, I actually, I've known Corin. I was trying to work this out, Corin. I think I've known you for about 12 years. And we yeah. met at an interview room for a large financial services organization oh, we did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when you were interviewing me and you made probably the worst employment decision of your life by employing me. So thank you very much for that back in the day. I don't think so. I did and get my revenge, I think, by giving you the most challenging projects I could find. <laughs> well, that, well, that's true. But then, but then we, we did also then subsequently work together in a different guise for a client where uh, where the tables were turned. Uh, you turned the tables on me. Yeah, <laughs> I remember. Um, but uh, but I've I've known Corin for for a long time now. Um, I mean, a little bit about Corin. Corin has a, a really rich history in business analysis and requirements engineering, covering a whole range of sectors from healthcare to telecommunications to financial services. Um, trainer, consultant in business analysis, but also I suppose a parallel. Um, discipline. Uh, Corin's currently studying a master's degree in, in uh, positive uh, applied positive psychology, is a master NLP practitioner and trainer. So we're going to talk today about culture, mindset and well-being and how to navigate the complex world of transformational change because it's probably true to say that we live in a really busy you know, world, we, we get burnt out on our projects, but also those that we are working with might get burnt out as well. So Corin, thank you so much for joining us today. That's fine, you're welcome, Adrian. So what I wanted to talk about first, Corin, and oh, and I should say, if you're tuned in live, please, please do ask questions as we go along. Um, you can type your questions in the Q&A window and we'll answer as many as we, as we can. So where, where I wanted to start, Corin, is I, I, I don't know about you, but I find there's a bit of an always on culture at the moment. And it seems to have really ramped up over the past five or 10 years where it's really hard to escape email, WhatsApp, Slack channels, you know, Jira tickets, whatever it happens to be. And, and I, I find myself sometimes having trouble switching off. How, how do you find the always on, you know, do you think the always on culture can affect well-being and what sort of tips would you give for avoiding that? I think it does yeah and we were reflecting just before we went live about when we first started work I think more for me than for you Adrian um, you know when I first started work it was all about paper yes we had computers the, the green screen IBM computers but we had paper and we went to talk to people and we weren't bombarded continually by information. I think now we've got, as you say, the internet, we've got WhatsApp, Slack, we've got multiple channels to communicate with each other, which is great, but we never switch off. Mm. You know, it, it, you know, the lovely mobile phone, which we have, which is great, follows us around. And on that phone, you can have your email, you can have all these tools to help us communicate. But I think the impact of that is that we do struggle to switch off and I think you know with a culture culture is really difficult to describe but it, it you know it's about the way we do things around here and I've found and I don't know if you've found that but when when you're working somewhere that sort of increasing level of communication and you know, emails whatsapp slack things you kind of get drawn into it and you find yourself behaving in the same way as everybody else and it's a bit of an unconscious thing and we all get drawn into it because we all at our hearts want, I suppose we want to fit in with where we are. We want, we want to be liked, but it does impact us. And it's one of these things, I think, that creeps up on us. Mm. This sort of always on you probably, it's great to, you know, you, your phone pings, you've got a message. In some ways that's good. And it's great to be able to communicate quickly and easily. But I find myself very easily distracted from work into something else and then I'm like oh I've forgotten what I was doing it, it, it's very true isn't it and and I think the the always onness 
it can create an expectation of an instantaneous reply. And, and, and before we went live, we, we were talking about, or we, I, I was reflecting on one of the first jobs I ever had was an insurance broker. Mm. And this was back in the day, it does sound ridiculous now, where when I first joined, I, I was sitting in front of a green screen monitor uh, and you know, there were memos that came in on paper from insurance companies and when and when when it when you know there were some policies where you had a manual proposal form that the policy order filled out you sent it to the insurance company but everything was a bit slower right because mm. if something came in well it didn't really matter if you reply if you wrote the reply now or at 4 45 it wasn't going to leave the building until five so do you think there's something about the in, the instantaneousness the sort of you can actually almost have a really albeit a really bad conversation, but you can have a conversation by email now. Yeah, you can. And I think there is that. If somebody sends an email, someone replies, then I, I found myself getting caught up in it. Oh, I'll reply. And it can be 6, 7, 8 p.m. in the evening. But mm. because it's there, you reply. And then you kind of get caught up doing it regularly. And there's no need to. But I think that's where it, I seem to remember noticing, you know, if I, I was particularly conscious of it when I managed a team of people, because I thought, well, actually, if I start replying to an email at seven or eight in the evening, then someone's going to reply to me and then I'm going to reply to them. And it's setting an example, but it's mm -hmm. so difficult not to do it. And in some cases, there's advantages of having that information, but it, in other ways, it's just blurring all the boundaries we have between yeah. our work and our lives and maybe for some people that's fine it, and, and it is interesting isn't it because the the boundaries thing if we think about well-being and boundaries it's interesting mm -hmm. because i think one thing that's probably true now more than ever is it's possible to work quite flexibly yes. and, and that might involve for some someone for example might involve working for a period of time then doing homeschooling for a period uh, then coming back and working in the evening but to others who perhaps don't know their situation so well, they might think that they're working very long hours and that might create a sort of parallel expectation that, gosh, that person's working 12 hours. I should be working. It's almost it becomes a, a, sometimes a bit of a virtual who can stay in the office longest competition, doesn't it? It does. Yes. Yeah. And I think that happened was once well, we were physically able to go to offices. It would happen in the physical office a bit as well yeah we have flexible hours but some people will come in early yeah but they get noticed leaving early and yes although yeah. it's never a said thing you just feel that there's i'm oh should i be leaving forget that you might have been there since seven in the morning and it it's really quite challenging i think and I, yeah right at the moment we could all work whenever we wanted really as long as we mm. get the work done but it takes a long time to change the culture, the way we work, the expectation. And it's who sets that expectation. Are we setting it individually? I was just going to ask that question, Corin, because I think the, the, it's clearly an issue that I think probably everyone, everyone listening in would recognise that, you know, there's, there's this always on culture. It probably leads to bur or could lead to burnout. So the the, the sixty four thousand dollar question is what what could we do as individual BAs or individual practitioners to help cultivate a culture where that doesn't happen? And and I mean one thing you mentioned there is I I, I think was a, a really nice sort of beautiful in its simplicity example is we'll set a good example, you know. And, 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 and as you were saying that, I was thinking that's really interesting because email tools will often have a schedule feature. So mm. if, you're, if you happen to be working late at night, but you don't want to risk, annoy, you know, risk other people feeling they have to reply, I suppose you could actually schedule it for the next thing tomorrow morning, couldn't you? You could do, yeah. yeah. Are there any other sort of tips on cultivating less of an always-on culture you'd have? Um, I think to start with, it, it's become aware of your own habits your own behaviors and you know I kind of, it's my voice of experience here I mean I love my job I love what I do and I could be working a long time and not give up and I would often hear myself going oh I'm getting a bit tired but I love what I do so it's fine you know I'm not going to get tired because I love what I do but we do get physically tired and I think it it's noticing those things 
and noticing actually I haven't taken a break I haven't looked after my my well my physical health or that kind of thing so I think it's noticing your own behaviors really mm. is one of them and noticing when because because burnout that kind of thing can creep up on you yeah it doesn't need to have a big kind of stressful event I mean some people do have very stressful events that happen but sometimes you I mean how many people listening to this call have worked and worked and worked loved their job and as soon as you go on holiday yeah you get poorly <laughs> yeah and it's that's because it's the the body going aha <laughs> you're relaxing so I do encourage people just to be aware and notice and for me some of the signals are about sort of tiredness creeping up maybe just getting a little bit irritable maybe noticing that you're not focusing as much as you were you're not making decisions for me it's it's a really difficult one to describe but for me it does feel a bit like a bit of sort of fog in my brain doesn't feel clear it just feels a bit murky yeah and it's interesting because I mean that really resonates with me as well Corin because for me I mean I suppose that feeling that that tipping point of burnout is different for everyone I suppose it is yeah but the way I would describe it is as overwhelm is when you know when you get in and it's like well there's 150 unanswered emails I've got a to-do list three weeks of things which I'm behind on um, and there's and, and now I've, and now the phone's ringing and I've got a text message where do I start type of thing so I mean what if, if someone's in that overwhelm situation have you any practical tips on how to start nudging away from from that that type of overwhelm um I do think if you find yourself in overwhelm, you know, the initial thing is to step back from all of it for a little while. And I've just noticed, um, I think it's Paul saying he works in 50 minute chunks and then takes five minutes of stretching. But the thing I'm picking up there, so, and thank you for your question, that's really good. Um, actually moving the body, moving away, actually changes your state, helps you free your mind up a bit. Because I think when you're in overwhelm, and you've got as you say all these emails to answer maybe somebody wanting something done you get to the point where you just think I can't do any of this and it's almost like you can physically you know switch off email switch off all the messaging applications but actually physically distance yourself from that environment just for a little while even if it's just uh, you know as Paul's saying here five minutes of stretching yoga maybe it's a quick a, a walk around the block a walk around your garden just change your environment because our bodies and our minds are quite closely linked yeah and, and it's interesting isn't it because I think often and again this is a personal reflection but when I've been burnt out it becomes for me a bit of a, a doom loop it, you know because I find I make really poor decisions when I'm burnt out and I over yeah. that's the irony thing is I, I over commit when I'm burnt out and, and yeah. it just becomes even worse. Um, so, okay, so another question for, from uh, Paul is, uh, what, what are some of the techniques for employees for focusing um, or creating focus time? Um, I think it is, you know, I, I'll just share what's worked for me. I think it is working out you know, what chunks of time are good for you to focus. And most people find that, you know, 40, 45 minutes, after that you start to lose track and if you really want if you've got a piece of work you need to finish do that first you know pick the most challenging and the tasks that need your focus when you're most at your best for working and I'm going to say in the morning but that other people might not be best in the morning but it's knowing so I suppose part of it's knowing your rhythm knowing when you're working at your best and pick the tasks that you need to get done at that point but things like you know closing down other applications taking switching off notifications so that they're not constantly buzzing up and i know from my own experience as soon as something pops up in the corner of my screen it grabs my attention mm. and as soon as it's grabbed my attention i've not focused uh, absolutely and i i i, I <laughs> i've started using the analogy of flight mode on a mobile yeah. phone yeah. And it, it, in fact, if I want to be really focused, I turn flight mode on, but I tell anyone else who I'm, I mean, at the, you know, at the moment working with virtually, I'm on flight mode between these hours. So 
like if it's if it's really really important then then there there is a landline you can get me on but no one ever rings that yeah. <laughs> um and uh, so i mean I'll, I'll share a couple of books i don't know if you've read these um corin but i found really useful on this there's one by cal newport i think called deep work oh yes um, i'm aware of it but i've not read it yet yeah that that's really interesting on focus and one i read more um recently is by near i forget his surname uh called indistractable which mm -hmm. is fantastic both of them you can get on audible if you're an audiobook fan as well um so okay so victoria makes an observation um a really really interesting observation which is i've noticed that that some people are always on for more senior members of the team but not so much for less senior members is it worth challenging that <laughs> oh yes i think so <laughs> As, yes, and I suppose that's that. Yeah, they're always there if somebody's senior asks. That I would question myself as to why I'm doing that. But yeah, I suppose it's a perception. It's, again, it's that whole perception. If somebody senior asks, they'll have to answer it. But I would question myself. Well, do I have to answer it? Just because somebody senior sent me something, do I need to respond to it? And, absolutely absolutely yeah, finding ways to challenge it and for me you know there are occasions when you know i'm thinking back to i used to be a programmer i was on call even sometimes when i wasn't on call if an, something happened that the system needed to be looked at then yes you would answer that but those were the days where people would phone you up if there was a real emergency but it's is then thinking actually is this a very urgent thing or can it wait till tomorrow and I think the trouble is at the heart of it, um, we, a lot of us like to please other people. Mm. And possibly this is pulling in, into what, you know, Victoria's saying here, we want to please our more senior staff. We want to be seen, you know, we want to be seen to be doing a good job, but we want to please them. We want to get praise. You know, sometimes that's unconscious that, you know, it's inbuilt to us that we want to to do well so it might then be why we will answer something as somebody senior says it yeah i mean it's, it's really interesting because I, I i was thinking about I, actually corin i was thinking we've worked together in lots of different contexts mm -hmm. <laughs> we got, have but one of the contexts we've worked together for as volunteers was for the iiba uk chapter when we were both on the board and and oh, that was clearly a time when everyone was on borrowed time on spare time and mm. and i, I but we would speak to each other in the evening because that was normal. But, but I suppose one thing, one, and I'm only reflecting on this now, really, but one habit I picked up is almost it's fine to ring anyone that you know well at any time. But the first thing I would say is, oh, hi, Corin, is now a good time to talk? And, and, and if you said no, then we'd arrange a time to talk. So maybe sometimes it's about giving the person the option to object. You know, they, they might have picked up because it might be urgent but then it mm. gives them the, the opportunity to to defer that perhaps yeah and i think that you know that's a nice nice way of giving somebody that option mm. to, rather than just completely launching into oh hi corin i need blah 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 can we have a chat about this yeah, you know, yeah. it's actually is this a convenient time Ah, fantastic. Oh, Nirav, uh, Nirav has uh, given a good reminder of the the author's yes, name yeah. for Indistractable. It's uh, Nir Errol. I, I'm probably mispronouncing that. Um, but Nirav, Nirav also yes, says that's an, that's an absolutely brilliant book. Um, so yeah, I, I found it brilliant too. Um, mm -hmm. So fantastic. So let, let's uh, let's take another question. So we have a question from John. Uh, who says, as someone also coming out of burnout, I'd like to thank you for the session. It's good to hear everything you've said. Uh, John reflects that one of the biggest problems was to get into a permanently failing mentality. Mm. I now realise that it was a less to that it was less a toxic business than an incompatibility. But the one thing I'd say from experience is, if something doesn't feel right, don't keep fighting through and trying to overcome it. Stop and reach out for people to help you to identify what's going wrong. And if you're a BA with a PM, PO or Scrum Master duties, try not to get into the mindset mindset of every fault is mine to fix. That's, I mean, I'm, I'm not yeah. sure there's anything I can add to that. I think that's a pretty profound statement, a very yeah. useful one. Yeah, a very useful, but I think, you know, what I'm, one of the things I'm going to pick up on that, and I, thank you, John, that's, that's excellent, is 
we do all have a natural negative negativity bias that you know, through evolution human beings will will look for we're constantly scanning our environment for are we safe is there danger around mm. which means that negativity things that are not good grab our attention and you know our role in projects is to find the problems and sort them out which is great and it's lovely and it's brilliant but we then can if we're starting to feel burnt out if we're starting to feel not so strong the negatives will always grab our attention and it, to try and balance it out with the more positive things gets more and more difficult the more tired you are yeah and i think you know you know i think i'm reading this correctly john i hope so but this the sort of i'm reading it as this is kind of you get an inside feel a gut feel for me i call it my inner guidance system that tells me something's not quite right and it could be that you know i've been working too hard and i'm burnt out or actually i'm in the wrong place i'm sure lots of us have had those situations where we've been on the world's best project and everything's gone really well possibly it's playing to our strengths then you get moved to another project sorry adrian i've done this to you probably <laughs> <laughs> and you think Gosh. actually this is this environment doesn't suit me it's a really difficult project or just the personalities or the type of project doesn't suit my skill set and you can immediately going from i love my job to i hate my job and we're not always going to get the best jobs but it's about knowing our inner guidance system and when we need to reach out for help and support. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that, that that's one of the things from, from John's observation that really resonated with me too is that actually it's okay to say that, you know, like it's okay to say I'm not feeling okay about this. That isn't, yeah. or in my view at least, that isn't a, that isn't a weakness. I think that's, a, it, it, again, subjectively, that's a, a strength because it sort of shows self-awareness and the person is you know is 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 seeing the situation for what it is mm. and again i mean for me I, I find that that feeling of uncomfortableness i don't know where where it is for you corin but it's in my stomach normally yes it's like um it's a mixture and and the thing i find really hard is some is i i find excitement and fear quite similar <laughs> so sometimes yeah. i don't know if it's because i'm i mean it's something i've not done before and it's a bit you know you've got nervous anticipation or whether it's not quite right so i find you know picking sometimes picking up the phone to like a trusted advice we've all got our trusted advisors and it's good to have one on speed dial i think <laughs> yeah it's interesting what you say about that not always knowing the difference between excitement and fear because i i was thinking about that this afternoon and i think you could i would still remember sitting on a roller coaster at the top being absolutely scared stiff yeah. <laughs> i don't like roller coasters having done it i had similar feelings but that was excitement and you're kind of like i don't know which is which and moods you know emotions moods whatever you want to call them our feelings are quite confusing sometimes you don't quite know which one it is and you have to kind of tune into your own emotions to work it out. Definitely. Sometimes. Yeah. Definitely. So, um, so Christina asks, um, Hi, what Christina. about the language we use to describe the issues? So, for example, I'm too thinly stretched seems to avoid the mental and emotional reality. Thoughts? Yeah. I think we do use a lot of metaphors linked to our sort of body as in like we're thinly stretched and our behaviors and i do think some of that then does come back to actually the mental emotional ones are difficult to describe and i suppose it's back to culture you know we'll quite more readily talk about you know, oh yeah I've, I've sprained my ankle or i've hurt my arm than actually my head feels weird and i'm not mm -hmm. quite on full I, I i sometimes say i'm not firing on full cylinders which could be my mind or it could be my body but i think it, it's been more difficult to talk about not feeling on the top of your game emotionally and I, hopefully that is becoming a lot more into the conversation and people are being more aware of it and i hope people will talk about it more because you know our minds and our bodies are very closely connected and it is getting them to all work together is how we fully function and are well. 
Yeah, I, I've, re- I've read a couple of articles, and again, I, I, these are articles I read a while ago, so I can't remember who, who wrote them or, or what site they were on. But what one was saying, essentially, we should stop apologising for everything on email. So, you know, oh, I'm sorry I haven't replied. Yeah. And maybe, maybe it's better to say, um, you know, a thank you for your patience type of thing. In fact, it might have been one of David yeah. Beckham's presentations, David Beckham, the BA's presentations. That yeah. He talks about not the dis- footballer. <laughs> not the footballer. <laughs> David Beckham, the BA, has got much greater insights. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they would be very different presentations. Um, yeah. So it might have been one of his. And also I remember on the whole, you know, um, burnout and, and to a certain extent work-life balance, because work-life balance comes into this, is, you know, the whole, well, you know, well, I, I haven't got time for X if you you know often people say well well i haven't got the opportunity to but if you start saying well i I haven't got time for for the things you're 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 actually turning away so you know i'll put my hands up and say i have been in situations where i've been like oh do you know what i'll 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 defer my dentist's appointment because i've got a meeting i've got to go to or whatever what you're really saying there is i haven't got time to look after my health or you know because i you know actually having yeah. had horrendous toothache in the past the minute you've got a toothache that's a real problem <laughs> it becomes your top priority doesn't it? yeah yeah it does so um fantastic so another reflection from paul and i've just remembered paul is is uh, tuning in from new zealand i've no idea what what um what, oh, time or what day it is there paul but thank you very much for tuning in oh, um, welcome um what one technique so Paul says one technique I've learned to deal with negativity and in, attention distractions is to start a task event or activity uh, with a thinking process uh, in this I set what I expect uh, remind myself who is dependent on this event and also how do I want to feel emotionally during this it gets the thinking aligned and the mind set on the moment it's about active engagement of the mind for now sounds like mm. a fantastic approach yeah very good and, and actually, if you if you remind yourself who's reliant on it, that's really interesting as well. It, it's connecting to a greater purpose, isn't it? It means that perhaps you're less likely to get distracted by the 13 LinkedIn pings on your phone type of thing. And <laughs> Yes, yeah. And I think that sort of almost that taking time to say, actually, how do I want to feel about this? Yeah, yeah. And you can tune into that. You know, I want to feel good about this. I want to be curious about it. Mm. Sometimes I find that if, you know if I'm finding a task difficult and I've been procrastinating on it because I'm not sure how to start it. So I, I mean, I love mind mapping. So I suppose I use my the logical part of my mind and and being an analyst to mind map it out, get lots of ideas or thoughts out, and then I try to tune into the fact that okay, I'm finding it difficult. I'll procrastinate. <laughs> you know, I'll go and wash the windows or do something else. But actually, if I try to change my mindset into, well, I'm curious to see if I could just get one piece done. And having mind mapped it out, I can then pick up small pieces. So I think what's coming out for me, and this I'm only really showing what I've learned through my experiences, is is tuning into what I, I suppose, partly using my strengths, because I know that I have a strength around curiosity and and so I'm kind of tuning into my strengths and what I know about myself to try and turn around that stuck mind mm. into a more positive mind. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm a real fan of mind maps too, and, and actually mm. rich pictures. Yes. Or just any kind of draw. Like I find if I'm stuck, draw something. And you know, but but yeah. it's a what I call a disposable drawing. It's not supposed to have any meaning. It's just a mental model type of thing. So, okay, so I want to explore, um, we've got more questions coming in and we will take as many as we can, but I just want to change direction just a little bit and talk about well-being or resilience. Okay. Because a lot of what we're talking about here also feeds into the fact that, you know what, many of us on the call here may be working on or have worked on major transformational programs, multi-year programs. It's really easy to get change fatigue doesn't matter whether it's waterfall or agile. In fact, if you're agile and delivering constant change, it can be, you know, in, in some ways even harder to maintain the momentum if it's going on for a long period. So breaking those things down, well-being and resilience, what would you say those two terms actually mean to you? Oh, gosh, to me. <laughs> so I'm going to say what well-being 
So well-being has actually been defined. So I'm looking at my notes now because I wrote this down so I wouldn't forget. And now I can't find my notes. <laughs> ah, here we go. I found it. So the Oxford Dictionary says well-being is a state of being comfortable, healthy and happy. And the World Health Organization, in, I think it was in 1948, so it's quite a long time ago, actually defined it as a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being. So what does all that mean? I think, so for me, it is about feeling happy, feeling that I'm, I'm okay to turn up in the world. And for me, there is a sense of balance between my physical state, my emotional state. And I think there's not the social bits not to be underestimated. And I'm sure maybe some of us are noticing that at the moment where we can connect online, but we can't physically be together. And that is a big part of our well-being. So well-being for me is around balancing all of those things. And, and it is interesting, isn't it? Because I know one thing I've learned over the years is that my how I feel mentally or, you know, my mental well-being is in, inextricably linked to physical well-being. Because, yeah. you know, I know if I skip an exercise session, I just don't have the motivation I would normally. And, you know, and I, I mean, I, I could, you know, I tend to do walks or runs or whatever but if i you know if i skip one i just feel lousy <laughs> yeah 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 and i think you know our this whole kind of connection our sort of our thinking and our feeling and our behavior are all very closely linked mm. the one i was saying earlier about feeling overwhelmed to go back go out for a walk or change your physical state is is a way to sort of reconnect the mental state as well mm. so you know coming back to we, when you're overwhelmed or i suppose coming back to that sort of the mood feelings you might some of us might get a feeling of tension anxiety feeling sort of stressed inside you know, we get these bodily sensations so in those situations it's probably good to go out and walk around slowly to sort of try and dissipate the tension and using breathing exercises is really valid as well. Mm. Um, you know, we all breathe. We have to breathe. <laughs> but I don't know about you. I notice when I'm tense, my breathing becomes very shallow. It does, for sure. And sometimes you can just, you know, move, move your chair back from your desk, close your eyes and take four or five deep breaths. It will completely change how you feel. Mm. And these things might not you might not notice this immediately that they affect your mental health but they will you suddenly find that for me the the fog begins to clear mm -hmm. and that's a really that's a really powerful metaphor for the fog beginning, yeah, to, fog clear. beginning to clear yeah so so, so, so corin if, if that's what that, uh, if that's well-being what would you say re resilience is is resilience the ability for someone to keep themselves well or is it more than that I think resilience, I mean, there's lots of papers on resilience and lots of different views on what resilience is. Some people think it's a personality trait. Others think it's a process. But for me, resilience is about how we adapt. Mm. As we go through our course of life, things happen to us. So good things happen to us. Not so good things happen to us. And it's how we adapt to those things, how we learn from them. And we all adapt at different rates. And some of that might come back to our genetics and the, you know, our history and the things we've had, experiences we've had. So I think for me that the link to well-being is you know, in a team giving everybody the space they need because we don't all recover from setbacks at the same speed. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm sure many of us on this call are aware um, in the UK we call it the Sarah curve, the change curve which comes from the work of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross but recognizing and I recognized it as soon as we had you know, the, the COVID-19 lockdown I was getting angry frustrated <laughs> annoyed and I suddenly went oh god so this is what's happening yeah and for, and for anyone not familiar with the, the Sarah curve it is I mean the Sarah curve is a version of the Kubler-Ross curve I think it, it, yeah yeah it is. so shock anger rejection acceptance hope type of type of thing um mm. so fa fantastic so uh, if you think about say well-being uh, i mean how do we ha any tips for like 
encouraging and protecting the well-being of us individually as a practitioner so what what could i do as a practitioner um, but also are there things i could do that would have a positive impact on the well-being of the people i work with whether that's my team or the stakeholders or the people impacted by the project i'm about to deploy and any mm. tips on that for him? um i think for personal well-being it's making sure finding time for things that you love and that's going to be very personal for each of us. And, and, and yes, it could be, oh, I love business analysis. I do it all day long, but I'm Absolutely. just thinking, <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's something called flow state. So just to summarize it for it's it, those states when you've got so absorbed in something that time seems to have disappeared. So for some, it might be, I've been so absorbed in a good book. I've been here three or four hours. Um, my daughter actually loves running and she's run lots of marathons but she says I just love the rhythm of my body when I'm running and for me that 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 keeps me well both mentally and physically her mind sort of sorts stuff out I mean I love the outdoors I do a lot of walking I go outside mm -hmm. um, but it's very individual and I think that does help with well-being if you can find a, a piece of time a chunk of time just to do something you love mm, you and if, you know sorry each other aren't we <laughs> um you know i think particularly when we do feel overwhelmed or stressed you sometimes forget you know and you have to think back to so what is it i do like doing mm. and it can be something really simple it doesn't have to be anything big and I know, um, well, I've seen from social media and we've discussed briefly in the past that you run a, a Fresh, Air, Fresh Air Fridays group. What, what's, what's, the, what, what's that about, Corinne? I do. Well, I did until we had to stay. Until in lockdown. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> but that for me, so that's bringing, I love being outdoors. And I think it comes back from, my husband used to be in the Navy. He was a submariner. So he used to spend up to six months of the year in a submarine. Wow away from the fresh air <laughs> and all he wanted to do when he came back so we lived in Devon would be go for a walk we'd go and sit out on Dartmoor but we noticed it wasn't just the fresh air and the space but it was about time to just chat and connect so for me that's I suppose when I heard about fresh air Fridays it, it's a bit like that so it's getting outside so you've got that change in environment the ability to switch off and slow down but it's a group thing so we also get an opportunity to chat to each other and connect to each other and i enjoy meeting people from all different walks of life mm. and it's called fresh air friday so we i do run them on any day of the week but it, the fresh air friday name comes from getting the friday feeling on any day of the week oh right oh fantastic <laughs> I, 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 that's a fantastic idea so mm. I, okay so let, let's take a, another question so we have a question from nefra and uh, Nefra says, uh, with working from home and therefore areas of the home becoming in effect the workspace, short of having a dedicated room, do you have suggestions for ways to disassociate the space from work activities at the end of the working time each day or each week? Really, really tricky, but very good question. Yeah, it's a very good question because obviously a lot of us at the moment all over the world are having to work. I mean, I'm very fortunate because I've been working from home, working for myself, working as a consultant for a while. I do have a dedicated space and I think I've appreciated it much more. Now I'm home every day because I was home maybe once a week and I'd be out traveling. But if you're not, if you don't have a dedicated space, you're probably in a shared space with family. You know, I was talking to someone earlier today who was working on his dining room table and I think yeah, the dissociation is the word. It, it's about having some form of ritual or routine that you can pack everything up. So yes, as Adrian said at the beginning, I'm also studying at the moment. And for some reason, I haven't really fathomed out yet. I don't often study in my workspace. Mm -hmm. I've got a very nice desk, but I tend to study at my dining room table. But when I finished, I pack it all away and I've got a little box I put it in and I put it to one side. And obviously, I know different people have got different amounts of space. But if you have got a space, you can just put things to one side or maybe it cover it over in the evening. It means that you can dissociate from that workspace. 
Yeah, I, I love the idea of having a ritual. And again, this is one of those things that I've, I've I suppose like, like, like many people, I've been reading quite a lot and listening to more audio books in the last few weeks. So I can't, <laughs> I, I can't remember which, this is when I listen, it might, this one might be from Cal Newport's Deep Work. I really can't remember. But there's, there's somewhere I read about having a, a shutdown ritual. But also, like, it, it's interesting, isn't it? We, we'll often say, well, I, I need to set a start time. So I'm, I'm starting, I'm going to be at my desk at eight you know, or seven or six or, or whatever time it happens to be. Mm. But very rarely do we say, and this is the time I'm going to finish. <laughs> so, or, or we might have a soft idea, but it, it blurs. So maybe there's something about mm. saying, right, well, I'm going to be at my desk at seven and I'm going to finish at this time. And unless, you know, unless the world is on fire, I'm, I, that's the time I'm going to finish. So, and, and, and the idea of a ritual, I think uh, that, really resonates even if it's just packing the laptop back up in its case or even if it's just folding the laptop in half and saying you know almost works works done until tomorrow <laughs> yeah yeah and you brought to mind for me so in the uk here we've now got a radio station called scala radio which plays classical music um and the presenter that comes on at the afternoon he's actually a sheep farmer who also <laughs> then presents classical music this is how much i've been listening to radio wow. But it's like he has one of the rituals that he always puts two pieces on back to back at 5 p.m. so he can go and feed his sheepdogs. <laughs> but he's also put in a 5.30 p.m. is the shut your laptops, it's the end of the working day. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and he'll, he'll do it every day. Mm. So it is, I mean, as he, we are creatures of habit, we do like our routines and our patterns. And I think you mentioned at the beginning that. I'm not sure what you did, but I'll mention, I'm an NLP practitioner, which is neuro-linguistic programming. The programming part of NLP is all about our behaviors, mm. you know, our patterns. And we have patterns of behavior because it makes it easier for us. So we unconsciously do things. And that's why we do seek a routine. So if we have a routine about, even if it's just putting your laptop and your papers on one side that is a signal to your unconscious mind that I'm now changing state from work mode to relaxation mode. Mm, yeah, some sort of some sort of trigger. So. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So we talked a bit about well-being, and just, I mean, just briefly, Corin, because resilience is a. I mean, it's a tricky skill to build, isn't it? It is. Yes. <laughs> and we probably all had situations where. Oh, you know what it's like. You're on one, and in fact, that's interesting. My shoulders literally shrugged as I was saying this. Which, <laughs> but you, you all worked on those those project projects or programs where it just feels like, oh, we're in literally caught in the crossfire. Like as BAs, yeah. we get caught in the crossfire. Yeah. And we sometimes have to make ourselves really unpopular, short term, because yeah. we have to we have to say all the unpopular things. Like, well, you know, I mean, not maybe not this bluntly, but. We, you've not thought that solution through very well and and actually we need to take a more holistic look at you know we need to put the brakes on things sometimes mm. but any any sort of briefly any tips on building resilience so that it, so that those sorts of things don't burn us out um i think for me it's it's thinking about the sort of i'm not quite sure how to describe this the sort of the personal you, your personal identity as a person and then your identity or role as a business analyst and being able to, to kind of swap between the two. Mm. And, and I suppose it, you know, I suppose the big easiest way I could describe it is like being an actor when you go on stage, you're, adapt, you're, you're taking on your business analyst persona and you have to sometimes say things that are unpopular, bring things out to get to the right solution. And again, it's a bit like, the, the leaving the work at the end of the day you have to sort of leave that role mm. and dissociate it from it and sort of come back to your personal space because we do take things personally we all want to do a good job it's hard sometimes and you know it's going to be difficult we're going to be in the firing line but it's not personal normally and understanding it from someone else's perspective yeah, yeah. I was just as you were speaking, thinking about perspectives and, 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 and empathy. Yeah. And the fact that, you know, I like to think, and maybe this is me being positive, that there aren't that many people who deliberately want to be really awkward. 
in the world and actually it's normally about so maybe that i mean you, you mentioned curiosity earlier maybe it's about being curious and saying well oh that's interesting i want i wonder what's i wonder what worldview or what set of what i wonder what knowledge or worldview they have which is making them think that and 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 if i know that maybe maybe that will change my view or maybe it'll help me have a conversation with them yes yeah curiosity so and i think um, sorry Corey. Oh God, i was gonna think and i think understanding that we've all got different personalities we all have different preferences mm. and somebody you know we're we're business analysts we like to analyze things and reflect on things other people don't they might see the world very differently mm. fantastic so um okay well let's, let's take another question uh, from milena so uh, Milena asks or, or observes, when I am burnt out, I find it helpful to attend training instead of taking holidays. Uh, this way I could still be engaged with my job, but change the scene, connect with yeah. different people and regain my confidence. I think that's a fantastic observation. <laughs> yes. And I think, you know, again, I'm smiling because for me, again, I know that I love learning or I wouldn't be doing a master's degree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I yeah, am wondering yeah. sometimes why, but that's the whole ups and downs of doing something there's challenges and not but you know Melaine has made a really good point it's probably something that she loves but actually going to training you're putting yourself in a new environment you're giving yourself the opportunity to use your brain in a different way but you're if you're still interested and passionate about business analysis and your role you're learning something new at the same time yeah it and, can and help re-motivate you and, and springboarding from from that point I also think things like conferences or IIBA events and, and if anyone on the call is a business analyst and, and isn't a member of IIBA or, or isn't connected to the local chapter you know I'd encourage you to take a look on the IIBA that's the International Institute for Business Analysis's website because you know chapter events are fantastic you know IIBA webinars are fantastic as well so good so moving on to something which i think probably underpins a lot of what we've talked about corin which is a positive mindset and yeah. to what extent i guess firstly to what extent do you think a positive mindset underpins well-being and, and resilience and and you know what is a positive mindset and how can we develop one those are big questions sorry Corin. Yeah, big questions how long have we got um so for me a positive i suppose a positive mindset is about our outlook on life and I mean there's a lady called Carol again I think you pronounce it Dweck or Dweck but she's written a book called Mindset and that's all about having a growth mindset mm -hmm. and you know many of us many people are born up with I'm um, you know I've got the intellect I've got and it will never change but underpinning it all a growth mindset which I kind of attribute to being pos a positive mindset maybe there's some difference is about curiosity having a learning mindset, wanting to find out things. But for me, also coming back to what you've actually said, the positive mindset, it is then about looking, I suppose, again, using that curiosity and learning mindset to look for the good in things. Mm. And I'm not saying that's always easy. And sometimes when we're in the midst of very difficult and emotional situations, you can't step back and go, oh, what could I learn from this? <laughs> But it's then the benefit of reflecting back later. You can say, actually, what was good about it? I mean, I don't know if you find this, but on, on the idea of reflection, I, I've, one thing I've found useful at, at different points in my career and in my life generally is journaling. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, but I discovered for me, and I don't know if, I mean, everyone's different, I suppose, but I found the, the way I can regularly journal is just do it in bullet points. Like, I, I don't write a lot. I mean, sometimes I do, but, it, but for me, and, and sometimes it's just about like, you know, I'll write things like completely messed up a call with X. Um, next time I need to do this. Um, uh, but then normally I look back at it in three days time and think it wasn't actually that bad. You know, the, the yeah. raw, rawness was there, but it wasn't, it's, it's rarely as bad as we think it is in the moment. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And I think for me, part of, again, it's, some of it's this back to, do you focus on the negatives or the positives? So we all naturally focus on the negatives. I'm saying we all, I think a lot of us do. 
Mm. And I remember numerous occasions. I remember discussing it with you, Adrian, after I'm sure we've done a presentation together. We get the conference feedback. Oh. You immediately go for the... The, the one than, bad piece. The one less than positive score, but you've got 99 lovely ones and one, and that's the one. And that's the one we look at. And it's then focus, stepping back and going, okay, so what was good? Mm. So you might have had the worst workshop ever, the worst day ever, but even if you can find one snippet at the end of the day of something that was good, it does start to train your mind to look for the positives. Mm. and sort of tap into those positives and, and I think the other thing is sometimes we don't know what's going on behind the curtain for people no and, and people can have stuff going on in that like I remember I was I think I was facilitating a workshop and someone was just seemed really distracted they were on you know they're on their phone a lot and mm. and you sort of think well am I you know am I not connecting with this person and you know and anyway i i in the end i, I had you know i had a I had a chat to them i did I, I didn't raise it with them because before i i could they essentially said oh i'm I, something like oh, i'm re really sorry i'm on my phone um i've got a bit of a crisis you know personal crisis happening at home with and, and then went into some detail about some difficult things that were happening so she, you know I, i've just got to send some text messages to to coordinate this issue and once I knew that I was like oh wow I'm really pleased you know thank you for telling me that because now I know it's you know it's 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 not that you're not connecting type of thing mm. so um oh a reflection from Tina yeah. uh, Tina says I, I recently heard the phrase positivity positivity is a learned behavior which means if you didn't learn it when you were young um you have to teach yourself or identify role models when older that's really interesting. I've never thought of that before or heard that. Yeah. I don't know whether it is a learned behaviour. Controversial. I don't know whether it is. I mean, I think we do, again, coming back to, I think evolutionary, we will, you know, we'll look for danger. Our bodies will scan for danger. You know, the mm. amygdala in the brain is there to look for danger. However, there is the one, there's a lot of work done by a lady called Barbara Fredrickson, who has written a book called Positivity. <laughs> And she's focused on positive emotions and actually why do we have positive emotions and it, and she's got a theory called broaden and build so and i'm going to go back to the caveman analogy so you know when we lived in caves obviously the negative things there so we run away when there's a scary mammoth coming or a saber-toothed tiger but actually when all around is safe we had to we had to venture out and look for food and be curious and build resources and she's saying that the positive emotions are the ones that allow us to go and do that. Mm. The curiosity is one of our more positive emotions. It's the ones that drive us to broaden and build our resources. So that's why I'm wondering, is it a learned behavior or is it in there? I suppose we probably learn to keep safe first. You know, a very young baby will cry when it's hungry <laughs> and get annoyed if it's uncomfortable. So maybe that's what's first. Then we do gradually learn to balance it out with the positivity. Mm, mm. It's interesting. As you were saying that, I mean, on, on a bit of a tangent, Corin, but I was thinking about um, something I, I heard, a, a, a lecture I heard recently by, and, and again, I, unfortunately, the name escapes me, but it was a professor who wrote a book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. <laughs> oh gosh yes and the what, what what i really took away from this half hour lecture he gave is that if you think about the uh the, the you know the, the brain and, and and emotional response well it, mm. if you go back to something like like a like a zebra it's got to run away from the lions and if it's yeah. got bitten it's got to try and stay safe and and so on and but the type of fear it has is very emotion it, it's very proximate if you make a bad decision you get eaten by the lion the types of decisions we make now, you might, you know, if you make a decision to eat badly in your twenties, you might not see the reaction to that for twenty years. No. And you know, and so what he posited was some of the anxiety we feel as a society these days is because there's such a displaced length of time from the, when we make the decision. Like, you know, have I invested in the right? You know, have, have I sorted my pension out, or, or those sorts of things? Just create that that anxiety. But but anyway, yeah. a bit of a tangent there, Corin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
zebras and pensions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, fantastic. Well, we're, we're almost out of time, Corinne. And I, and I mean, we, we've covered some really broad ground there. Just before we close, if you had one tip or one or a couple or, you know, one tip for, for people about really looking after their own well-being, particularly in the current situation with lockdown and COVID-19, what would that tip be? Gosh, I think it is to know yourself and you know, take that time to be aware of what's happening for you. And I do really like the, the point you made about journaling, you know, whether it's journaling, writing something down, mind mapping, drawing. I found by just getting some of my thoughts out on paper, mm -hmm. I can then look back at it. So that, you know, that might be one. But I think that kind of tuning in, tuning in, and I think one of the questions earlier talked about that kind of intuition, that knowing something's not right, just allow yourself to stop and work out what that is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, I, and I'd add to that, actually, springboarding from that. I think now is a time more than ever for those that, people that we know well. If you get a sense that they're not okay, ask yeah. them if they're okay. Ask them, yes, yeah. And I think we haven't talked about it so much, but one of the, you know, and I think when I talked about the definition of well-being, being mental, physical and social, mm. we do need to connect with each other. So, yeah, I would think if you need to just reach out and talk to someone. Mm. And as BAs, we're very good listeners. Absolutely. <laughs> so Absolutely. Listen, and I think you're right. We will notice we'll notice signs from somebody before they might say it. Mm. Well, that, that's it. And sometimes it's if, if there's someone you know well, it's actually easier to see they're burning. Like, I, I find that sometimes people who are outside the situation can see it happening more than the person in the situation. So you've got that, mm. that, that sort of power of, of, of observation. So, well, thank you very much, Corin. I mean, a really, really fantastic session. I am certain people will want to stay in touch with you, um, yeah. you know, learn more about what you do. What, what's the best way for people to connect with you? Is it on social media or how should, how should people uh, stay in touch? Probably LinkedIn is, is the easiest way. So I'm on LinkedIn, Corin Thomas is, is the easiest one, rather than giving out long email addresses mm. <laughs> and all that kind of thing fantastic so and i'm on there quite regularly i have actually i've just written something today about walking ah. the benefits of walking so i think manoj has just said here take a walk or have a coffee break yeah 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 absolutely yeah, is it building spaces in building little spaces in you don't always need a long space mm. to reconnect and Recharge. Yeah. Recharge. yeah absolutely yeah very happy to engage with people on linkedin if they want to continue the conversation Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Corinne. A really, really interesting and insightful session. It, uh, you know, it's amazing how much we can cover uh, it, it, in an hour. And um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, or if you're watching the recording, thanks for watching the recording. And, and really, as, as a bit of a reminder, these BA community webinars are very much about perhaps talking about some topics that are outside of the normal topics that we might talk about as BAs. So you'll see if you go back and look at the recordings there's a whole range of recordings on previous topics we we look we, we like to sort of push the boundaries a little bit um after the session you will get a, an email uh, and in that email there will be just a short survey i would be very very grateful if you could fill that survey in um, one of the questions on there is what topics would you like covered in future and if you put a topic in there and it's one that, you know, I can find a speaker for, then I'll, I'll, I'll try and run it. Equally, if there's a topic you would like to speak about, then, you know, either contact me or put it on in the survey and, and you know, let's let's make that happen. So um, fantastic. I hope everyone is keeping well in these in these strange circumstances that we that we find ourselves in. Uh, at the moment, I'm doing webinars weekly. So um, do take a look at the other webinars. When you, if you're watching live, if you ex when you exit, you'll see a list of them pop up. Uh, we've got webinars coming up on the Scaled Agile Framework, on business agility, on business analysis, what's new and what's next, um, a whole range of things. So do, um, do register for those as well. So thank you again, Corin. Thanks everyone for tuning in. 
have a wonderful evening or, or, or morning if you're Paul, because he, he's 6 a.m. in New Zealand, I think. So that's real yeah, dedication. Very dedicated getting up at six in the morning, Paul. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. And, uh, and hope, hope to see everyone again soon. So keep well. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Adrian. Bye.